So uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I'll try to keep this relatively short because I'm also I'm actually looking forward to the panel, and I always prefer having discussions rather than you having to listen to someone rambling in front of you. Um, so thinking a little bit about the future of the set top box, and I will ask I will keep uh, some questions a little bit open. I'll ask some questions also to stage for the discussions later on because I think um, there are very a lot of different takes uh, on this. Um, ben mentioned earlier um, it's, uh, it's the battlefield. Um, someone early on in my career um, suggested to me um, don't mention the war so I will use uh, fr friendlier, um, uh, friendlier uh, pictures. Uh, a little bit about myself, only, so this is a horrible picture, but uh, quickly talking about software, and since some people I met earlier didn't quite knew that I ch uh, changed jobs, um, I'm dealing with pay TV operators and set top boxes for a while, primarily on the software side of things. Um, um, so uh, my take on this might actually be slightly different than uh, what Darren just pre presented, coming a little bit more from, uh, from, from the hardware side, but it is interesting to see where this intersects. And looking at some of the, uh, the, the things I worked on, um, for example, Microsoft Media Room, like the early days of bringing telcos into, into the, the, the TV mix um, with Android TV, it was like early days of bringing, trying like open source platforms or free platforms into, uh, into the mix. Um, and for both of those, actually, I remember early on talking to the industry, everyone laughed, right? Everyone said, I still remember first IBCs um, talking with telcos about delivering TV over DSL lines, right? That, that's a stupid business idea. Why, that costs way too much money. Why would you do that? That's not a product. Um, first IBC is talking about, hey, you operator, why don't you run your, your cable setup box on Android TV? And they laughed, right? Like, why the hell would we allow third-party content and uncontrollable services on our equipment? That's a stupid idea. So, as you can see, I have a history of stupid ideas. Um, uh, since last year, I'm continuing my stupid ideas at uh, Viewed. <clears throat> In case you haven't heard about that. Um, um, I think in most TV devices, you will find some components uh, from us. Um, um, with 275 million devices deployed worldwide. And you see customer base, I'm just saying that because it lines up nicely later for, for the timelines. Um, we work with a lot of vendors in the smart TV and set-top box um, uh, field. And I do think this is interesting when we talk about the future is also where that intersects. I don't think you can discuss the future of the set-top box without discussing the future of TV sets in itself. Um, so when you look at the, some of the history of, of Viewed, and which was back then uh, still called Opera TV, um, the kind of the first streaming setup box, for example, that delivered YouTube into a living room was um, the Nintendo Wii. Um, and that was the very first time that, for example, uh, YouTube product managers actually called up um, Opera back then, say, hey, what? that device, we see a lot of traffic from there. Kind of the first like OTT services getting it into the living room, right? So um, we have, and over time then with Philips, the net TV, right? The very first kind, uh, kind of TV. I think we've always been a little bit on the, uh, um, um, on the intersection of, uh, of OTT broadcast and getting services, mixed services into the living room. Talking about the future, you can't really do that without talking about the past a little bit and how set-top boxes have kind of evolved and why they were, why they were in the living room in the first space, right? It's, in, a, in a lot of cases, it was bringing in, there were new content needs or there were new transportation needs to get content in, into, the, into the living room. And that has a cons there was a consistent theme of Content needs needed a conduit to, to transport them in, into the living room. And the setup box for a very long time has been this conduit, right? It has enabled new forms of, of content, of entertainment um, that, wasn't, that wasn't foreseen just a few years uh, earlier and has, added, has brought it into the living room as an add-on to your trusted TV set. And as you can also see, it has gotten 
smarter and smarter with new features, right? It is not just about delivering video and pixels. It has been about added functionality. Things like DVR um, has been having new kind of standard expected features over time uh, that the set -top box brought in. So, but where does that lead in the future? Um, in the last few years, there has been kind of the perception that um, um, the set box also has become a little bit of the insurance policy of, uh, of TV operators. Uh, I already mentioned it is obviously the conduit to entertainment. So uh, for the longest time, the operator was the key content aggregator bringing, con uh, bringing content into the living room um, and using the set box as the only outlet. Um, quality control, it was the central point where the operator could control how um, the content looked, how the user experience was exactly uh, how they wanted it. And then also the security aspect, right? For um, a, a long time, set -top boxes were the only way that an operator could guarantee content is not replicated, copied, um, uh, they could safely deliver content as they um, have agreed with the content owners themselves. But things have changed a little bit, right? So um, the operator is not the only content source anymore. Uh, it's not the central content aggregator in the home necessarily anymore. Um, and also user expectations, um, we have seen that over years with user surveys and so on. Um, the moment users have experienced that they can have almost any content anywhere in their pocket, it's incredibly hard to explain to them that they can't have that in their living room, right? That content X, no, that's not available on your setup box or on your TV because of X, Y, Z. The consumer doesn't care about this and they have experienced that this is possible in a different way. And this gets, incre this gets increasingly hard to explain. Um, as I mentioned, the content sources are growing. I don't think we need to discuss this. Um, <clears throat> Uh, with lots of OTT players coming in, um, obvious uh, statement. Um, smart homes, I won't go into details there, actually Darren touched on a lot of aspects here already, but the key point, the setup box is not an isolated device anymore. It has to communicate with other inputs and outputs throughout the house, with content sources in the house, with microphones in the house, with with your security system and so on. So it's not an isolated device anymore, which increases complexity. And um, the, other, the other big thing um, I think that has happened in the last few years is also just um, the rise of connected TVs. So a lot of technology that was kind of exclusive to set-top boxes um, uh, in the last few years has become kind of standard, has become, uh, become commodity. You don't have to buy an expensive, well, no, even a cheap OTT box just to watch Netflix or YouTube, right? That's every TV you buy today ha uh, has this. So if we abstract that a little bit, what, what are standard building blocks of a, of a modern uh, TV experience? Um, quality, I think there is still a perception that operators think, oh, we still have an, a quality advantage. We can control our quality is a lot better. We have the highest picture quality. We have the least amount of micro freezes and connection drops. A big question is, does the user care? Where's the threshold, right? Um, if you see that um, users are actually perfectly fine with Netflix uh, UHD content, sometimes under certain conditions, for 10 seconds dropping down to HD and then going up to UHD again, there are no consumer, like, customer care calls about this. Um, so the question is, where is the threshold, right? Where, um, um, and how does the setup box uh, can, can actually guarantee, uh, can guarantee these things for any kind of content, not only cable broadcast, but also OTT content? Um, selection, I think that's obvious. You have to offer any kind of content the user wants. Otherwise, they switch to a different device. And at some point, they might not switch back to your, to your device anymore. Um, I think the smarts are important, and I don't think that connected TVs today, that oftentimes are called smart TVs, are actually smart. They're connected, they're not smart. And I do think, um, guide, for me, a smart system is someone that takes the user and guides them through a very complicated content world, right? There are tons of different sources, 
there are different inputs, there are different uh, rights for content, um, that they, what they can and cannot use. Um, a smart system can navigate, take the user by the hand and, and guide them. And that means also um, taking a user who is used to an EPG guide for the last 20 years and actually giving them that EPG guide and then taking them by the hand and also showing the other possibilities, right? Um, one, of the, one of my typical complaints of, uh, of specifically Silicon Valley product thinking is that you just put the latest and greatest in front of the user and take everything other away. I don't think that works, right? I don't think that works for TV. Um, hybrid TV, I do think people sp specifically in the in, inside the industry, also depending on location, are underestimating how much content is still being watched actually from broadcast sources, <clears throat> from antenna, from cable, from satellite. Yes, OTT and SWOT services are on the rise, but if you still look, if you look in the regions, depending on what region you're looking at, we are still talking 85% plus viewing time in the living room on linear content delivered over traditional uh, non-IP, uh, uh, sorry, uh, traditional means. And so how do you blend that with a growing amount of OTT content and have a hybrid experience? And then secure and cost efficient, I think that's obvious, but with, uh, with lowering margins, also the pressure on what a set-top box is allowed to cost has grown significantly. And how you, can you deliver all these things while at the same time trying to save costs? I'll, uh, I won't go into a lot of detail here, but what you already see is that this has happened in the market, right? Like the amount, uh, the amount of uh, deployments where third-party applications are now becoming standard on set-top boxes. Uh, recommendation services are being added over the last few years, 4K videos, voice control, and so on. Whoever, this is, this is an interesting aspect. Um, this is from a Nagra MTM um, analysis. Whoever in this room wants to deploy touch remotes, buy me a beer, talk to me, and I will explain you all the reasons why that's a horrible idea. Um, but key point here, this has started. This is not just some slideware stuff. This is really um, already deploying in the market. So to finish up, where is the future of the setup box? I do think we will see in the next few years, we will see an increasing move of operator services into smart TVs worldwide, not, not only in, in Europe, but worldwide. Um, there are, from a technical perspective, there are not a lot of good reasons left why you have to have for basic TV distribution services, um, um, no matter if it's IP or non-IP, uh, a separate device. You see initiatives like HVB TV Op app and some other initiatives to kind of drive and help to transport operator experiences onto standard retail devices. I think there's an interesting question around uh, revenue share and what the, oper uh, what the OEM can get out of this, but uh, I think that's an important aspect. Increasingly, services are going into the cloud, right? Why having an expensive set-top box, a hard drive, or other logic in the device itself when it can move in the cloud? We see regulation worldwide more and more kind of agreeing and green lighting cloud DVR. There are more exciting services actually moving into the cloud. Um, look at uh, Google Stadia um, announcement where you don't have to have an expensive game console anymore. That's moving into the cloud. So how many of the services are actually really needing a dedicated device is, is a key question. The mobile device, I was at a panel, I think IBC three, four, five years ago, I don't remember, um, where everyone was complaining, oh, content consumption is completely moving away and is moving to, uh, to mobile devices. The younger generation is not, is not using the TV anymore. I don't think that's true. And we're have, we have, we have, we have, we have increasingly seeing statistics that um, uh, while there is a lot of consumption in mobile, the, still the majority of, uh, um, of content consumption in the home is on the big screen. And I think we have also seen that second screen experiences so far have not been successful. So I'm personally a little bit pessimistic on the mobile device uh, uh, angle here. Last thing, are set of boxes just getting smaller and cheaper and are basically slimming down, right? So is the future of any uh, big expensive set-up box maybe a $20 dongle because that's all you need to ensure everything I talked about earlier. I think those are 
the, the interesting question, and I hope we talk a little bit uh, at the panel, on the panel about it. Thank you.